Why are you smiling? It's kind of fun. Hey everybody, welcome to Screen Crush. My name is Doug, I'm Ryan's on vacation. And this is all the Easter eggs and references from She-Hulk, episode six. I, I'm kind of nervous, I don't want to do this. Hey Doug, it's Colton from Comics Alliance. You want some help hosting? Oh yeah, that'd be great, thank you. I am so small. All right, well, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Colton Ogburn, in for Ryan Airy. We open with Jin getting invited to be a bridesmaid at an old friend's wedding, and when this box explodes with confetti startling Jin, we are reminded of the fact that Jin has full control of her Hulk. No overwhelming feelings of rage. No, a normal amount of rage. When packing for the wedding, we hear Nikki mention that Jen doesn't need to bring a Luke Jacobson business suit to the wedding. Luke Jacobson being this character from the previous episode. We're going to need a lot of fabric. Luke Jacobson is based on this character from the comics who is also a fashion mogul. Nikki then says that she wants to see the super suit Luke made her, confirming that the extra piece he handed Jen to try on last episode was indeed her super suit we've seen from the trailers. I made you a little something extra. Jen at this point is still convinced that she will never be in a situation where she needs to don a superhero costume. We then hear Jen break the fourth wall to let us know that yes, this is a self-contained wedding episode and that while it may seem inconvenient for this point in the season, that makes sense because weddings are always inconvenient. So this tells me that Jen is aware of the fact that we were all hoping for a Daredevil episode following that stinger at the end of last week's episode. We then see that the opening title has been changed for this episode from She-Hulk Attorney at Law to Just Jen Attorney at Law, just like we've seen it change before to She-Hulk Attorney for Hire in episode 2 and She-Hulk by Titania in episode 5. Jen's friend Lulu, the person who is getting married, we hear her mention the names Jackson, Sam, Greg, and Mark as her fiancé Adam's groomsman. We think these could be references to other Marvel characters who share these same names, such as Jackson Norris, aka Nighthawk, who first appeared in Incredible Hulk number 126 in 1990. 1970. Sam could be a reference to Samuel Stearns, aka the leader. The leader was teased in 2008's Incredible Hulk, and he is now returning over 10 years later in Captain America 4, New World Order, alongside another Sam, Sam Wilson's Captain America, formerly the Falcon. Now with the plot thickening this episode regarding the quest for Jen's blood and the final scene in the laboratory, we think it's likely that the leader may show up in this series prior to Captain America 4. And we think the name Mark could be a reference to Mark Ruffalo, who of course plays Jen's cousin, Bruce Banner, aka the Hulk. Now back at the offices of GLK and H, we see Mallory and Nikki working with Craig Hollis, aka Mr. Immortal. Mr. Immortal is an actual character from the comics whose superpower is immortality. In the comics, he discovered that he had this power by attempting to kill himself multiple times. He first appeared in West Coast Avengers Volume 2, number 46, in 1989, and then he later went on to become the founding member of the Great Lakes Avengers. The Great Lakes Avengers later found themselves in legal trouble for using the name Avengers, and they were sent a cease and desist, meaning that they could no longer use the name. Oh, is that how it works, Your Honor? Yeah. Back at the wedding, we get what at first sounds like a sweet scene between Jen and Lulu, where Lulu asks Jen what she's been up to. Jen gives a very happy update about her her life and her new job, heading up her own division at a very prestigious law firm, as well as her newfound superpowers. No, I didn't mean any, I didn't want that. Um, like, are you dating a guy, a boy? Is there oh. a boy in your life? Apparently all Lulu cared about was whether or not Jen had a man in her life. Instead of caring about all of the incredible things Jen is doing on her own as a successful independent woman. This scene stays true to the theme of the show, showcasing the struggles women go through on a daily basis. The nonsense women have to put up with from obnoxious men and even other women. Just people in general who are obsessed with material things and outdated social norms. People who refuse to open their eyes to all of the great possibilities life has to offer. And then we get a flashback to 2009 when we hear Lulu get asked by her friends if she's Team Edward or Jacob, a reference to the Twilight films, specifically New Moon. Fans divided themselves into Team Edward or Team Jacob depending upon who they wanted Bella to end up with. Now when Titanium shows up, you'll notice that she is wearing boss earrings. This could be a reference to Mr. Immortal's other alias, Boss. 
We then hear Titania gaslight Jen by saying that not everything's about her in response to Jen accusing Titania of only being at the wedding to mess with her. Which, obviously, yes, that's the only reason Titania is there. And it's rich to hear Titania say, Not everything is about you, Jennifer. When literally she is the type of person who is obsessed with making everything about herself. Oh, get over it, Jennifer. The name's She-Hulk. It's mine. And then enters too good to be true nice guy, Josh. In the comics, there's a character by the name of Josh Glenn who takes up the helm of the villain Hatemonger. The Hatemonger villain was originally a clone of Adolf Hitler. Maximum effort. Josh Glenn was a character who had a disdain for immigrants, and after Josh became entrenched with online conspiracy theory sites, he learned about the hate monger and decided to continue his mission as the new hate monger. Now, while the character in the comics was more of a racist, I could see them shifting the character into a sexist for the She-Hulk series. And honestly, sexism and racism kind of go hand in hand. They're both parts of the horrible human being starter pack. Now, with the reveal later in the episode that there is an online conspiracy website gunning for Jen, more specifically She-Hulk, and we see that this mysterious Josh guy is trying to get close to Jen, I think it's likely that we're going to learn he is none other than Josh Glenn, aka the hate monger. More on that creepy website in a bit. We then learn that Lulu has mistreated the waitstaff, shocker, I know, and she is now asking Jen if she can help clean up and tend to empty glasses and whatnot. This reminded me of another great female-led fourth wall breaking show, Fleabag, when Fleabag's stepmother, portrayed by Olivia Coleman, who is also in Secret Invasion. Anyway, it, it reminded me of this scene from Fleabag. Would you just hold on to that and um we now get our first mention of the Intelligentsia website. The one for hateful man babies. Like I said, deeper dive on that in a bit. And then we meet Jonathan. Jonathan. Of course. Be careful, he leaks a little. Oh. Now, this frail little dog's name being Jonathan could be a reference to the anything but frail Jonathan the Unstoppable, a Wolverine that Squirrel Girl rescued from a lab where he was being experimented on. Jonathan first appeared in 2016's All New Wolverine number seven. Now, this wouldn't be the She Hulk series' first Wolverine reference. If you remember back to episode two, we got a mention of a bar brawl featuring a man with metal claws. The name Jonathan could also be a reference to Jonathan Hart, aka the Jack of Hearts, a Marvel character that we may have seen a reference to in last week's episode amongst Pug's Marvel character-themed shoe collection. We hear Mr. Immortal mention that he still has all of the Apple shares that he bought back in 1981. For some context, Apple Computer went public in December of 1980, meaning that Mr. Immortal likely bought these shares of Apple for about 20 bucks a share. One of those shares today would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. We also hear Mr. Immortal mention that he was left gold by his first wife, Baroness Cromwell. Now, a Baroness is the female equivalent to a Baron, both being a title for a high-ranking person. Cromwell is also a name shared by many historical figures such as Oliver Cromwell, Gregory Cromwell, and Thomas Cromwell. These are all Cromwells that this Baroness could have been related to. Now, back at the wedding, we hear Jen's cousin Ched, who is DJing, refer to himself as the Inchedible Hulk. It's your boy, DJ Incredible Hulk! This is, of course, a reference to his two cousins, the Incredible Hulk and She-Hulk. We now learn that one of Mr. Immortal's wives ran a jade shop, jade being a mineral used in jewelry that is, you guessed it, green like She-Hulk. We then hear Mr. Immortal say that him having to apologize with 20 seconds of eye contact will be interminable. Interminable meaning having or seeming to have no end, which is the perfect definition of Mr. Immortal's life, considering that he cannot die. We then hear Jen drunk call Bruce to ask why he isn't at the wedding. I'm sorry to get a hold of you for weeks or months or days or whatever. Now this line from Jen showing confusion as to how much time has passed in this series is interesting and making me wonder how much time is supposed to have passed since Jen became She-Hulk, as well as how long Bruce has been off planet since he left for Sakaar. I got some things I gotta take care of. We then hear Too Good To Be True Josh say, This is the most fun I've seen you have all weekend. They're Wednesday and Thursday. Likely a reference to the fact that She-Hulk airs on Thursdays, but kind of on Wednesday nights because for some reason they just can't release it at a normal hour so that me, Ryan, Doug, and the team don't have to get up at freaking two in the morning to watch it so we can make our Easter egg videos. Fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. That's like 16 walls. 
Okay, so anyway, Jen is drunk, and Titania is wanting her to morph into She-Hulk to fight. And once Jen does morph into She-Hulk, you see that she is no longer drunk. This is a reference to this scene in episode one. Bodies metabolize alcohol at an incredibly fast rate. And it's also a reference to this scene in episode two, where She-Hulk has been drinking, and when she reverts back to Jen form, she becomes drunk. And then to close this episode out, we get a look at the Intelligentsia website. It's like the dark side of Reddit, I guess, and like 4chan and 8chan or the whatever chan I, I can't keep up basically it's a website full of disgusting and hateful memes made by guys that don't have anything better to do than hate women for merely existing we can see articles like this one we then see this hulk king emoji that looks a lot like the peppa the frog meme now, Pepe the Frog was seemingly this, you know, cute internet character that has unfortunately been turned into a bit of a hate symbol. Creeps on the internet started using him for racist, sexist, homophobic, graphic, and violent hate-filled memes. We see Nikki create a fake account to gain access to the Frog King's account on this website, and in her fake account you can see that she listed interests such as Bigfoot, UFOs, and elk hunting. This is clearly a jab at the more meat-headed side of the Joe Rogan fanbase. We then see some hateful posts calling to cancel She-Hulk. We see a post that says, when you a Hulk but still dumb. And then it gets dark with a post that reads, someone just shoot She-Hulk. We then see some memes perfectly reflecting the small-minded thought process if you can even call it that of these types of dudes on the internet wants equality but still wants you to pay for dinner wears yoga pants but mad when you look guilty of dressing like a man we then get more posts such as how do we swat she hulk eight reasons she hulk needs to die how do we kill she hulk and then under that you can see we need to get rid of her does anyone know what can kill her it's time to do something all ideas and discussions welcome now i gotta tell you this whole thing with the website and the creepy dudes it really reminds me of the Batman and how the Riddler was able to bring together a group of unhinged people to do some awful things. Special thanks to everyone for the tips on detonators. Detonators. After seeing the website and the death threats, we see Nikki start to call Jen, but Mallory says that there's no need to bother Jen with a bunch of trolls. You can then see Nikki look straight into the camera for a second. Now, while this is likely just an accident where the actress accidentally looked into the camera, something that happens from time to time, but in a show that breaks the fourth wall, I, I can't help but wonder if Nikki was glancing at us, thus breaking the fourth wall. We can then see Jen and Josh sharing a plate of fries, but as we pan out, we can see that they are being watched from a laboratory. In this lab, we can see a tank of green liquid similar to this green liquid we saw in Samuel Stern's lab, aka the leader in The Incredible Hulk. On the same screen, we can see the words gamma range, gamma being what's in Jen and her cousin Bruce's blood, and the way they are able to process gamma is what gives them their powers. You and I, we share a rare combination of genetic factors that allow us to synthesize gamma radiation. We then see a message pop up on the same screen from the Hulk King that reads, is the next phase phase of the plan ready to go. And then we can see the bent needle from episode 3 when the wrecking crew tried to steal Jen's blood. Sorry. <laughs> Followed by a look at a newer, more aggressive looking needle that I'm guessing may be made of vibranium, creepy dude Todd, who many fans think is very likely involved in this scheme to steal Jen's blood, did bring up vibranium on their date. Yeah, my skin is impenetrable, at least with anything on earth. Even vibranium? And hey, vibranium or not, they better have a freakishly strong person lined up to stick her with this needle, because it doesn't matter how big and bad the needle looks, Hulk skin is damn near impenetrable. And I just want to say, please do keep an eye out for a follow-up video for this episode because we have some theories regarding Todd, the leader, Daredevil, and more that we cannot wait to share with you. In the animated credit sequence, we can see Jen sitting at her desk, and on her desk, we see stacks and stacks of papers. On top of one of those stacks is a folder with a S.H.I.E.L.D. logo. Now, S.H.I.E.L.D. played a major role in Phase 1 of the MCU, but ever since we found out that it was actually under HYDRA control in Captain America Winter Soldier, it's played less and less of a role in overseeing the Avengers. We now have other organizations such as S.W.O.R.D. and the Department of Damage Control coming into play. So I'm curious to see to what degree S.H.I.E.L.D. is still operating in the MCU and why Jen would have a S.H.I.E.L.D. file on her desk. What superheroes could perhaps be involved with a S.H.I.E.L.D. mission and now in need of legal representation? All right, well, there are all the Easter eggs we found for this episode, but if you found any we missed, please do let us know in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter. If you're new here, please do feel free to subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Colton Ogburn.